Hey everybody, my name is Adi Osmani and today I'm going to talk to you about large scale application and how to build large applications using JavaScript and jQuery. So I work for AOL, your grandmas probably know what that is. Um, we're still around, we're doing some interesting things these days and my responsibility at AOL is sort of developing applications that can scale. So on a daily basis I'm looking at things like modularity, maintainability, um, internationalization and all these concerns are a little bit too big to sort of fit into one talk, but what I am going to cover today is how you can take your, I'm going to, I'm going to show you an, a set of effective design patterns for taking your sort of mid-sized applications and preparing them for growth so that they stay maintainable. Now, what does that involve? So the first thing we're going to take a look at is decoupling. Now, a lot of the experienced JavaScript developers in this room are going to have covered de uh, decoupling at some point in the past, but we're just going to get a refresher in it. So what is decoupling all about? And it's about separating units of code that don't depend on each other. So if you have like monolithic giant blocks of code that you could be breaking down into smaller pieces, realize that that's going to make them a little bit more maintainable. Let's look at an example. So let's say you have like a spreadsheet. There's not, there's not really a concept of a spreadsheet component. That's actually composed of many other logical pieces that you can break that down into. And if you break down something like a spreadsheet into a grid, a filter, a formula editor, you then have these other little pieces that you can go in and maintain a little bit more easily. But more importantly, you can start reusing these things in other projects. And that comes with value to your business. If that means that like, you've, you've worked on a project for six months and you can go start the next one knowing that maybe that's shaved off a month or two of development, that adds value to your business and it's definitely something worth doing. Decoupling isn't just about sort of breaking down larger modules into smaller pieces. It's about trying to do things a little bit more intelligently. So one thing you can do, and this happens all the time, is trying to reduce the risk of breakage in your application. A lot of the time when we're developing things these days, we try communicating directly with components. And the problem with doing that is we form a dependency chain and where one thing breaks, the rest of your application can just throw out an exception and stop working. We don't want that. What we want to do is be able to create user experiences that are seamless, where possible, don't show any breakage, and if there is breakage, why don't we try building applications where the user doesn't notice that, where the application can heal itself and fix those problems. So this is a basic, this is, this is a very basic idea. This is like, um, I'm using jQuery deferreds here, it's a simple Ajax call to a, a mail.php service, and when I get some data back, all I'm doing is I'm calling a few different mod models. Not, sorry, modules. I've got a modals module and I'm saying, okay, well, show a preview of that message. I've got an audio manager where I'm saying, okay, well, maybe play a little sound clip to say you have a new message. And I'm also calling another module for sort of increasing the message count in my UI. The problem with doing this, and I see a lot of people writing applications in this manner, is that let's say that something goes wrong with your models module and it stops working or it just throws an exception that completely crashes your application. There's no reason why the other parts right after that shouldn't be able to execute because that's not going to break your user experience. What your users won't see is perhaps the modal message saying that you have a new message, but they will actually still get the audio clip playing and they'll still see that, you know, there's another message that's come through. And you can, you can create applications like this quite easily. I'm going to go through this in a little, a little bit more detail quite soon, but here's exactly the same thing except if you take a look at the line right after data equals jqxhr, I'm publishing a message to the rest of my application. All that this, all this block of code is responsible for is just telling the rest of the application, hey, there are some new messages available. If you want to do something with it, go ahead. It doesn't have to actually be concerned with communicating with anything directly. So at the very bottom, you'll see there, there are some subscribe statements. I'll talk about those shortly. But basically, all those are doing are subscribing to that event and then executing some additional behavior based on it. If one of those breaks, let's say that, you know, again, the modals break, you'll still be able to run the others and the user will be able to continue using the application without any issue. I think there's value in that. So the way that we generally implement this type of system is using PubSub. This is, again, these are just basics that you've probably read about before. We use PubSub for this. And the idea behind PubSub is we're trying to implement the observer pattern in JavaScript in a way where we can logically decouple of objects generating events from those reacting to them. So if my application has new messages, if we have some sort of module handling, you know, the whole message queue, 
tell the rest of the application there's a new message, let other modules do anything with that data that they want to be able to do. There are a few different ways of implementing this. I'm not going to show you all of them because we, we don't really have that much time. But jQuery comes baked in with a way to do PubSub. It's, it's come with this for a few different releases, lots and lots of releases. Um, you can use trigger uh, as a publish. So you can actually trigger an event name and say, OK, well, hey, there's a new message. You can use on, which is essentially um, the same as a subscribe. If you're using an older version of jQuery, you'll probably be using bind instead of on, but it does the exact <coughs> same thing. And if you prefer using the actual PubSub verbs, you can use um, ben Almond's wrapper around these functions, sorry, around these methods um, that basically just give you subscribe, publish, and unsubscribe capabilities. It's very, very easy to use. There are probably three other ways of doing PubSub just using jQuery alone. Um, I'm not going to cover them in this talk, that they will be sort of on the slides in the extended version. But let's move on. So all of us are developing applications in a particular way right now. We probably have modules. We probably have libraries in our stack. We probably have templates, maybe an application core, widgets, toolkits, whatever have you. And that's absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with developing applications in that way. But there are some problems with this. If one part of the application breaks, do the current applications we're writing actually have the ability to fix that? Do they have the ability to say, OK, well, this particular module is broken. I'm going to stop it, restart it, and keep the rest of my application running so there is zero break in the user experience. Does anyone, is anyone writing their applications like that right now? I don't think so. But it's possible. It's very easy to do, and it's something that we are going to go through later on in this talk. But there are other problems. So when you're developing at scale, there are greater concerns. You have to wonder about how many of the modules you're including in your applications these days are actually reusable. If I went into any of the repositories you're working on at work and said, well, hey, I'd like to use that, would I be able to without having to, to do a lot of rewriting? If I wanted to go and test that module that I just extracted from your repo, would I be able to easily test it free of your system? I don't know that we could probably say that about all the applications we're developing. And again, when you're starting to develop at scale, there are other concerns. Like, you might have multiple teams working on the exact same page. You might have multiple teams working on different widgets, different components. And all of these might have to exist on the exact same page, especially if it's a single page application. And you want to ensure that when those widgets and modules are communicating with each other, none of them are able to break the behavior of another team's work. So we're going to look at ways that you can work around these things. So patterns. We're going to look at some fundamental patterns, and then we're going to see how we can actually use these to fix some of the breakages um, in the way we're developing right now. So the facade pattern. How many people here have heard of the facade pattern before or looked at it? I really hope that me writing about this hasn't influenced it. OK, so the facade pattern. The facade pattern is basically, if you, if you look at a facade in the dictionary, the idea behind it is that you present one view to the world and you conceal something else. And that's what the facade pattern is all about. It's about simplifying the usage of a module through a very limited API. And you're actually using this every day. If you use jQuery at all, you're using the facade pattern every single day. When you're using the CSS method, animate, tributes, all of that is using the facade pattern. Because what we expose to the public is something very, very simple, something very easy to use. But the complexity behind each of those methods is actually a lot greater. The thing is, you don't have to worry about them. And that's the beauty of this pattern. It hides implementation level details. So here's a very basic implementation of a facade. Um, I know that not everybody is going to be able to see that code, but it's basically a module. It's using the module pattern in a way, um, where we have some private behavior up there. And what we're returning is our facade. Let me zoom in on that a little bit. All the user cares about is actually being able to get some behavior working. They don't care about all of this other private stuff or any of the complexity in this module. And so developing interfaces in this way means that you're simplifying how people can use your code base. And it comes with a few other advantages I'm going to show you quite soon. Here's another example from jQuery core. So everybody uses document ready at some point if you're using jQuery. Um, that's powered by bind ready. And if you take a look at the source, what you'll see is that Bind Ready is doing a few different things, including normalizing event listeners cross browser. Now, you don't have to worry about that. You just use Bind Ready or you just use Document Ready, and all of this is taken care of for you behind the scenes. Mediator pattern. 
How many people here have used PubSub before, just out of interest? So a fair few, good. So the mediator pattern is a lot like PubSub. I like to describe it using this analogy of air traffic control. So in air traffic control, you have this idea of rather than planes communicating with each other directly, you have a tower do that instead. Could you imagine what it would be like if like above London Heathrow, all the planes were talking to each other to try to figure out if they were gonna land at the same time? Like, oh, hey, sorry. Yeah, that would be a mess. That would be a serious clusterfuck. <laughs> yes. Um, but the idea of that whole system is that you use something central to control all of the chaos that can go on. And that's why the mediator pattern is interesting. It's a centralized controller. And if a centralized controller can work in that ecosystem, why isn't it something that we can apply to JavaScript and use there? So going back to PubSub, a mediator is, 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 is essentially offering you a way to, to do PubSub. It allows modules to broadcast or listen for notifications. This is an implementation of the mediator pattern. You don't really have to worry about the details here. Just note that there's a subscribe and a publish method on there. And it's very easy to use, the same way that you would probably use PubSub. You just call something, in this case, it's a centralized PubSub um, system. Mediator.subscribe allows me to subscribe to an event. Mediator.publish allows me to publish events and broadcast it to the rest of my system. <coughs> Fairly straightforward. But the cool thing here is that you start to realize that you can actually create completely event-driven systems. This is, like, this, is, this, is, this is something that might look a little bit like Gmail if it was really badly designed, but you've got, you've got this idea of chat, you've got messages, and you've got notifications. Now, none of these parts of the page actually have to directly talk to each other at all. Like, look at the notifications, which is just like, you can consider that a title bar, you can consider that like a little um, modal window that pops up saying, hey, you have new messages or whatever. All that has to do is keep an eye out for any other messages from your application that might say, hey, there's a new instant message. Hey, Paul's trying to get in touch with you at 5 a.m. in the morning. Um, or hey, there's a new email. In the same fashion, if you, have, um, if you take a look at the, the messaging side of this, it might wonder, well, hey, are any people actually online to talk to that have been sending me emails? It might be something you're interested in. But none of these have to talk to each other directly. You can just broadcast events, and you can have as many modules in your system as you'd like actually listening to those events and reacting based on them. And the mediator pattern is about more than just PubSub. What you're doing is you're centrally having something handle all of the um, broadcasts and all of the notifications for your system. And so you can actually start doing some fun stuff there. You can start validating that input. I'm going to show you how you can actually use the mediator pattern to do application level security. So that if you do have people trying to you know, develop from other teams um, for the same system, you can actually sandbox your content so that it won't break. Now, we're not really going to have that much time to cover modules, but some very quick information on there. We've got a lot of different ways to write modules in JavaScript at the moment. It's not a bad time. We've got object literals, which have been around for forever. It's like a modular way of writing objects. You've got the module pattern um, if you want some simulated privacy. JavaScript doesn't actually have access modifiers and probably won't until ES Harmony. So module pattern is pretty cool for that if you, if you care about keeping things private. And then there's AMD, which I'm using on a daily basis. How many people here are using AMD for their application? Okay, cool. So AMD is, is amazing. It's like, it gives you this ability to create asynchronous modules and easily define lots of different dependencies and dynamically pull in dependencies if you want or like have external templates and, and all sorts of cool stuff. Um, but read up on it if, if, if that's something that interests you. But let's take a look at large applications. I've probably asked about 30 developers who've been writing JavaScript for a long time now to define what a large application is. And it's difficult. It's difficult to define it. Um, I asked a beginner what they thought a large application was. They told me they thought a large application was something with two megabytes of JavaScript code on it, to which I just like sat down and started crying. I really hope no one's developing systems like that. But in my view, a large application is something a little bit like this. It's a non-trivial app requiring significant developer effort to maintain, where most of the heavy lifting of data manipulation and display falls to the browser. It's a somewhat loose definition, but I hope that it, 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 it's at least better than saying, well, hey, it's an application with 100,000 lines of code. Gmail is probably my favorite JavaScript application. It's built using the Google Web Toolkit, which compiles to sort of optimize JavaScript. It is GWT that it's built with, correct? It was. It, 
was. Okay, I probably should have asked this beforehand. <laughs> Gmail used to be built using GWT. <laughs> and one of the interesting things about it is that you actually have lots of different components on the page that are constantly communicating with each other. And it's rare to find Gmail breaking. Even though they have features like labs where you can actually um, inject other people's behavior into the application, you have to have some sort of sandboxing in place there. Otherwise, they'll have the ability to actually crash the, the entire application. You don't want that. So let's brainstorm. I've, I've taken a look at, I'm not sure what happens when I do that. It's quite interesting. Anyway, um, so we've taken a look at some patterns. We've looked at the facade pattern. We've briefly looked at modules. We've looked at the mediator pattern and pub sub. What would be a perfect architecture for a large scale? Well, maybe something that's loose, something that's loosely coupled to make sure that you know we can develop things in a very maintainable fashion and easily reuse things. Smaller independent modules would help with that. And maybe it would be useful to consider flexibility. Right now, if you're developing a large application, there's a good chance that you're going to end up relying quite heavily on a particular set of libraries or frameworks, what you do. And you might easily spend six months, seven months, eight months on that project. Imagine what happens if two years down the line you find that that library is no longer being supported or there are major defects have been found in that library and they're no longer being fixed and no longer being patched and you'd like to switch to something else. There's generally quite an expensive cost involved in switching libraries. So can you develop applications in a way where you don't have to worry about that? We're going to take a look at that. Modules, in a nice architecture for, for large scale, maybe we consider, you know, modules are going to notify us when something interesting happens. We don't want them touching anything they don't have to. Because if modules are able to touch anything in the system, that means that they can break anything in the system. And we want to ensure that where possible, nothing can stop the entire application from working. So our solution is a combo. We're going to combine everything that we've looked at so far and define an architecture that scales. This is an architecture that has worked for AOL. It's an architecture that has worked for Yahoo. And it's an architecture which might work for you. One thing that I will point out is that whatever I describe, do, do remember that you don't have to use all of it. You can use bits and pieces of it, shape it into whatever form works best for your projects. But let's take a look at it. So we're going to have this idea of an application core. And our application core is going to manage our entire module's life cycle. It's going to control if the module can be started, if the module can be stopped, if it can be restarted. And what that gives us the power to do is actually be able to say, OK, well, maybe something's gone wrong with a module. Would it be useful for me to actually stop it completely and restart it so that it can continue doing whatever it was that we defined it, we wanted it to do in the first place? That's something that we can't really do in a lot of the architectures we're using in our apps right now. So an application core might look something a little bit like this. This is only a very small snippet of it. But basically, you have this way of defining modules. You have a way of starting a module using um, calling an initialize method on it. So every module in the system might have an initializer and a way of destroying the module so it'll stop working. Maybe we'll make it so that the application <coughs> core can react to actions passed to it from a sandbox. That's going to use the facade pattern I'm going to talk about in a moment. But the mediator or the application core can handle all of the architectural decisions for your application. You don't have to have individual modules replicating this every single time. So we talked about, OK, well, we want this architecture to have a publish method and a subscribe method so we can actually do pub sub, right? So the mediator, that, I consider that part of our, the architecture. That's part of the communications for the application. And the mediator has got its own implementations of subscribe. It's called a register and publish using trigger. And we also want the application core to be able to do things like add and remove modules without having to worry about this causing breakage. In any system where everything is decoupled to the point where you're just concerned about notifications and broadcasts, it's actually very easy to do that. Because what is a module in that case? It's just something that subscribes to events. It's not something that directly has to communicate with other modules. And so if it stops working, if you've developed your application properly using these concepts, if it stops working, it's not going to break the rest of your application. So I could, I could easily be defining a, an entire to-do application, binding different 
bits and pieces of my modules to different DOM elements. I could simply say, OK, well, all of these are responsible for just subscribing to different events from the application and responding to them in some way. Again, one of these breaks, the rest of the application will continue working. And the application core can also handle error management. So again, right now, in a, in a lot of the applications we're building, although we might have some level of error handling on a modular level, we don't have it on a system-wide level, where if a module breaks and stops everything else working, we can actually restart it. So this architecture allows you to do those things. The next component is the sandbox. So the idea behind the sandbox is that it's an abstraction of the application core. And it's used for common tasks by the modules. So if a module wants to do something like publish a new event notification, it uses the facade for that. This is a little bit of a possible sandbox. It's got a publish method, a subscribe method. It's communicating directly with the mediator to power these. And that has some other friendly little functions that you can use. You've got a find, you've got an ignore, so you can ignore different notifications if you really want to make sure your application doesn't respond to those. And it's got some other things. The sandbox is also an interface for interacting with libraries. So rather than you directly using a library, one way that you can develop your application is in a way where you create an abstraction around your library. I know Christian is not a big fan of abstractions, but at the same time, there are places where they're useful. You can create abstractions around libraries. You can have like a common interface to different libraries. Let's say that you're used to using um, store.js or some other framework for sort of um, storing things using local storage and managing that. If you wrote an interface that allowed you to actually hook that up to different solutions, you could easily switch those solutions around in probably one or two lines of code without having to rewrite the rest of your application or the rest of your modules to do that. You can also do things like, I'm not, I'm not necessarily recommending this, but you can also have your facade pipe um, things that go back to jQuery. I can say, have my own interface for how I'd like to do animation, event handling, etc. And the sandbox can also be used as a permissions manager. So in the applications we're writing right now, we don't actually really put that much thought into preventing um, modules from being able to like, do things on the page. We just think, OK, well, we're creating this. We're going to roughly know whether something's going to touch something else. It's fine. It's absolutely fine. But consider having like, a team of 30 or 40 people working on an application. Just saying it's fine is not going to work there. You actually have to start putting permission structures in place so that you can stop things from happening that you don't want to. You can even have like a permission structure. This is extremely, extremely simple. Um, so I'm saying, OK, well, if there's a notification that comes out that says there's a brand new message available, I'm going to allow my message composer to subscribe to that. I'm going to allow my notifications module to subscribe to that. But maybe I don't want like that message, its contents, or anything to do with that to be stored to local storage using an offline store. So I'll say false on that for now. That can be used for enabling features at a later point. It can be used for security. But the point of this is a lot of us aren't using these kinds of structures in our applications right now, but they do offer some power. And then we have modules, which are essentially going to be unique blocks of code and unique blocks of functionality that we can reuse fairly easily, hopefully. Now, this is a simple module. It's going to have an initialize method, and it's going to have a destroy. Initialize allows us to do things like subscribing to notifications of interest. So in this case, we're writing a status widget to say, what's the latest status of the application? And what we want to subscribe to is anything interesting happening in it. So this is from a to-do application. And one thing you're going to be doing there is adding new entries to the to-do list. So the status widget is going to subscribe to any event that says, OK, well, there's a new entry available. It's going to have a destroy. This is a very simplistic destroy. All it's doing is setting the status to nothing. You could go a lot further than that for, for destroying the entire module if you wanted or, or stopping it from working. And then when something interesting happens to this, like it detecting that there's actually been a new notification, you can have this publish its own events as well. You can have this say, OK, well, hey, there's a new status available. Maybe another part of the application will actually want to do something like this, like log it somewhere or display it somewhere else, or just like update the title bar to say, hey, there's a new notification. 
So I'm going to show you a demo now. I've got five minutes left. Now, I am not going to be showing you anything as amazing as what Paul showed you. Thank you, Paul. But so I created to do MVC a while back. And I get to spend a lot of my time writing to do applications using many, many frameworks, some of which are very, very good, and some of which are really, really terrible. But what I'm going to show you is how you can develop applications in such a way that if you do use abstractions properly, you can actually do something fun. So just to check, this is a to-do application. Um, hello, jQuery UK. God colors, wow, all right. So this is basically doing a few different things. We've got event delegation going on. We've got some animation. We've got some random color stuff going on as well. That's all cool. I don't actually know what's powering this application right now. Let's find out. So I scroll down and I see, OK, well, this thing is using these two lines. It's got some modules and it's got a facade as well, but it's using these two lines. That's including the latest version of the jQuery library. And it's also including my application core. And in this case, I've decided to say, OK, well, maybe in a few years' time, there might be something better than jQuery. Maybe I might want to switch out to something else in the future. So this application that I just showed you is currently using jQuery for everything. So I click on buttons, I type something in, I hit enter. It's, it's handling everything, and animation, and Ajax, and all that stuff. Now, here's a little magic trick. Let's say I type in Dojo, and I do that. I reload the page. I say, I just replaced my entire application's capabilities from jQuery to using Dojo. Everything to do with the animation is now going through Dojo. Everything to do with the event delegation is going through Dojo. Um, this also supports Ajax. All of that is going through Dojo as well. And that just took me one or two lines of code to change. That's the power of abstraction. You can actually abstract around libraries in such a way that you don't have any costs involved in actually having to go and, and switch it out at a later point if you discover there's something else that's a little more performant. Because this is a jQuery conference, I should probably go back and just change that to jQuery. But that's what this application architecture is capable of doing. It allows you to be flexible enough to easily replace one library with another. Now, before we go into the further reading, just to quickly summarize, what do we look at today? We looked at a set of patterns for being able to easily make sure that your application continues working. You've got an application core that allows modules to, to be stopped, started, restarted. We looked at the facade pattern. We saw that how, how it could be used for handling application level security. We looked at how we could write slightly smarter modules. And this entire architecture is something that you can change as needed. If you just want to be using um, the pub sub mediator parts of what I talked about, you can do that. If you want to just use the sandbox, you're free to do that as well. But there's tons of articles on this. I write far too much. There's lots of stuff that you guys can go and get. And that's it for me. Good news. AOL internet sometimes works. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>